Good morning and welcome on this Sunday morning. If you're joining us by way of live stream, we want to say welcome and we're praying for all those who've come down uh, with something this week. It is the season, uh, but I'm glad that you're here. If you're with us in the house, uh, we're thankful to be in God's house today. Let's stand together and find our songbooks and sing 162, To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Hath Done, page 162. It's a little bit cool in here, but we just raised the temperature, so don't take your jacket off just yet, and uh, it'll warm up a little bit here in a couple minutes. Page 162, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. the purchase of blood to every believer the promise of God the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives praise the Lord praise the Lord let the earth hear his voice praise the Lord praise the Lord let the people Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he hath done great things he hath taught us great things he hath done and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. Amen. We've had a great week, even though uh, some have gotten sick. My whole family uh, is sick, and so pray for them if you would. They're not violently ill, uh, neither have they uh, been diagnosed with any uh, harsh uh, disease, but uh, they're all at home watching by way of live stream and many others. Uh, and so I hope that uh, you're doing well today, and uh, I'm going to for, uh, forego any shaking of your hand. I'll wave to you today. That way, whatever's in my family doesn't get to your family. I figure that's the neighborly thing to do, uh, but glad that you're able to be here uh, this morning. Made some good progress. I put uh, some updates in the bulletin, uh, some good progress on uh, the parsonage uh, this week, and excited for that, and uh, the baby has arrived, but uh, still trying to get it done and get it all taken care of, and uh, exciting news on that. And then I was really excited uh, I didn't expect this, but our uh, faith promise commitment rose once again, and uh, that is excitement, exciting to get us to $124,564 uh, for the year, which is uh, the highest commitment we have had uh, in recent history, about the last 15, 20 years. Uh, I don't know of anything before that, uh, but as far as our church is concerned, form formerly to this was about 123,600, something like that. Uh, and so we praise the Lord for that. Uh, and as Paul said uh, to the Corinthian believers, now the doing of the matter. 
uh, now just to give faithfully. And if we each give what it is that God put on our hearts to commit, uh, then we're able to see that all taken care of. And that is exciting. And so thank you uh, for being a part of that. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we just want to say thank you. How grateful we are, Lord, we're nothing. Uh, Lord, without you, we can do nothing. But Lord, you are everything. Lord, thank you for being our all in all. Lord, we lean on you. And Lord, you enable us and give us the grace to do what you've called us to do. And Lord, we thank you for that. In the end, all we can say is to God be the glory, great things he hath done. Lord, you've done it all. Lord, we're just thankful to be in the midst of it. Lord, I pray that you bless the service that we have ahead of us. Lord, I know uh, many are out, but Lord, we're excited to be able to share uh, your word today and share this time uh, around your word, singing uh, and giving praises. Lord, I pray that you be with those who are sick. Lord, I pray that you touch them, and raise them up and make them well. And Lord, we are grateful uh, for your healing hand on us. Lord, bless us. Lord, I pray, forgive us where we have sinned against you. Uh, Lord, and I pray that you would fill us with your spirit that we may receive your word. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn to page 159 in our handle. 159. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme who gave his son for man to die that he might man redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Page 159, please. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of man, what's ruined by the fall? Thou hast devised salvation's plan, for thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now the last verse. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace, of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, whose reign shall never cease. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Every time I sing that song, it makes me grateful for children's church workers. Uh, when I was young, they taught us this song, had those big flashcards. I mean, remember uh, poster boards or flashcards, and they, they would put it up there. And I learned this song, and I had it memorized uh, from singing in children's church by about eight or nine years old. Uh, and it seems like one of those songs that whenever I just need to uh, have a song to praise, I know all of the words because of it. Uh, and I'm thankful for children's church workers. Uh, by the way, we've been uh, doing some work on our YouTube channel. Uh, channel, Bible Baptist Temple, uh, and I know we switched over. We were at BBT Live. Uh, that was because of an issue that we had with the channel uh, for a while. That's been solved, and so if you're not back on Bible Baptist Temple uh, with our little logo, you'll know it because the little logo there, uh, then you can get that back plugged in or linked or however you do that. I encourage you to do that. So if you're not here, uh, 
you can watch it by way of YouTube. Also, uh, starting to put our sermon series in playlists. So uh, maybe you missed some and you'd like to go back. Uh, you should be able to find them in playlists. And we're also trying to take uh, the graphic that is up here for the sermon and then put that on the YouTube uh, so you can kind of identify it by uh, the sermon series. So hopefully that'll be a help uh, if you're going back to watch anything. Uh, my wife is in uh, Patch the Pirate Club every Wednesday night, uh, and then people tell her how good the sermons are on Wednesday night, and then she feels like she should go back and watch them. I love that. Keep doing that. Even if the sermons are lousy, keep telling her, how, oh, that was an amazing <laughs> sermon. Uh, just make her feel like she should go back and watch those. Uh, I'm just playing about that. Uh, looking forward to sharing uh, God's word with you today. Let's bow for prayer and ask his blessing on the offering. Lord, we thank you that uh, you have given and put things in our hands. Uh, Lord, we're thankful that, that those things meet our needs. Uh, Lord, I'm also thankful it allows us to look around us and be a help to those who may not have. And Lord, it also allows us to give back to you just a portion of what you've given to us. And Lord, I'm thankful that you uh, set it up in that way, that it was a, a proportion. It was not the same giving for everyone. But Lord, as we have been blessed, so uh, we can give. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be cheerful givers. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll allow you to remain seated as long as you sing out, because I'm going to need your help. My voice is not strong, but the song is As the Deer, uh, As the Deer. If you know this one, sing along with us. If you don't know it, learn it. It's a great song as a prayer to the Lord. As the deer, there we go, here we go. As the deer panteth for the water. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Any other 
so much more than anything. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit heal. You alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you. desire and I long to worship you. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn to John in chapter 18. John in chapter 18, our special this morning, uh, would have been the teen choir, but more than half of them are sick. And so I uh, pray that they'll get better and I'm sure they'll sing again. You know what that means? This means this is the day you should go to Cracker Barrel uh, because you'll get out early and be able to beat the crest. So if you're wanting to go, uh, this is your day. Maybe even the Mexican restaurant down the street. I don't know, uh, but this is your your opportunity. Uh, John in chapter 18, John in chapter 18, we've been in this series uh, entitled uh, Dwelt Among Us, uh, that Jesus Christ uh, is the Word made flesh and he dwelt among us. And I'm thankful that God uh, is not a distant God. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Uh, they believed in this uh, matter of uh, providence, and I, I do believe in providence, but uh, in the colonial period, they had the idea of a God who was uh, a provident God, but what it meant is that he set everything in motion uh, and then he has just let it go through time. He saw ahead, uh, and just like you and me roll a bowling ball and then just let it hit the pins as it will, uh, that God at the beginning of time set everything in motion and then let it go. Aren't you glad we have a God who not only set things in motion, but continues uh, to intervene in human history, continues uh, to be there for us day by day, and he says pray. By the way, if, if he just set things in motion, uh, then there wouldn't be any reason to pray. He said pray, and then he responds uh, to prayer, not because he has to, not because we can force him but to do anything by prayer, but because he said, I want you to pray. I want you to ask, and then you have not because you ask not, but when you ask, seek, and knock, you will find those things. So God is still uh, active uh, in our lives today, and I'm thankful for that. I'm also thankful uh, that he did not leave us alone uh, to be condemned in our sin, but he sent his son, Jesus Christ, uh, as God who became flesh and he dwelt among us. That meant, first of all, he was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. It also means that he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, uh, that he has gone through what we have gone through. Uh, it also means that he could be the spotless sacrifice for sin, the only qualifying sacrifice for sin. Uh, the Bi Bible says the blood of bulls and goats could never uh, take away our sin. It had to be uh, the Lamb of God which takes away uh, the sins of the world. And so Jesus Christ came and dwelt among us uh, that we might one day, as God became man, we as man might dwell with God. And praise the Lord uh, for that. Now we're in uh, the crucifixion uh, story. And so I want to uh, take this moment to direct your attention to John 18. 
Uh, in verse 28, we are moving from uh, the house of the high priest where they do an impromptu calling of the Sanhedrin and questioning of Jesus Christ to now uh, realizing that if they're going to want to get uh, a uh, capital punishment conviction, then they're going to have to uh, get him to the Roman government uh, and so now at the break of day, now that the night has elapsed, they're going to take him uh, to Pilate. John chapter 18, John chapter 18, let's make sure I'm all good to go here. I think I am. John chapter 18 uh, and verse 28. If you're able, let's stand uh, for the reading of God's word. John 18 and verse 28. And we'll read down to verse 36. John 18, verse 28, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? And they answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. And the Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. By the way, he said that when he said, uh, And I, if I be lifted up, lifted up, what is that talking about? That is talking about crucifixion. And the Bible says this uh, signified he uh, in the death in which he would die. So he knew that he would be raised up uh, in crucifixion. Uh, in verse 33, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, saying, say, or say, Answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you bless uh, this reading of your word to our hearts. May we receive it. May we remember it, Lord, when all is said and done today, Lord, if my words are forgotten, Lord, I pray that your words would not be. Lord, I pray that you would uh, work in our hearts. May we uh, hear the truths here, uh, Lord, and then recognize how uh, we can be at times uh, wrongly or wickedly motivated. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would not fall into this category. Uh, Lord, it was by wicked hands he was slain. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You might may be seated. Scuba divers take their world with them. <laughs> you know, when you get into the water, you recognize one thing. You are not a fish. <laughs> uh, you don't have gills on the side, so you have to go down, uh, hold your breath for a little bit, come back up. I can remember as a kid, my, my parents did accuse us of being fish because my grandfather had a swimming pool, and we would get out there, and we'd start swimming uh, about 10 in the morning, and then they bring us out bologna sandwiches, so we didn't even have to really get out of the pool. Uh, we would eat, you know, and then they had that break, because you could get a stomach ache and drown from it. How many remember that? Uh, you know, you can't eat and then swim immediately. Uh, I don't know what ever happened to that. They don't seem to believe it in anymore. Uh, but back then, you know, we took a break, probably about four minutes, uh, uh, to make sure we were good and digested. And then we were back in the pool, and we'd be in there all day long. I'm not kidding. At times, so from 10 in the morning uh, till 4 or 5 in the afternoon, uh, we would just swim, swim, swim. You say, didn't you get sunburned? No, we had the tan from the day before, so it was okay. Uh, well, at some point we got summer, uh, but we would just swim and swim, and my dad would say, I think you guys are growing gills out of your neck. Uh, but I can remember trying to swim the length of the pool in one breath. How many of you did that? Uh, the length of the pool in one breath, and I, I mastered that uh, pretty quickly, and so uh, then it was an underwater swim uh, for the length of the pool. Then it was 
uh, the length of the pool and how far back you could make it. And so my brother and I, we would compete. We would go length of the pool and how far back we could make it. And then I remember when both of us could do length of the pool and back, one breath. Then we started going for three lengths of the pool. <laughs> now, it really determined uh, by how long your pool is, okay? Uh, if you're in a kiddie pool, that's not a big deal. Uh, this seemed to be somewhat of a standard-sized pool, and I can remember uh, feeling like my head was going to explode because I was trying to hold my breath uh, for that third length of the pool, and I would come up and <gasps> get this huge breath because I was trying to make that oxygen uh, last. I don't know if I ever made three links of the pool, uh, although I got pretty close uh, to doing so. I realized I did not have gills. <laughs> uh, water, although it was the world I could uh, be in, was not the world that I was of. Uh, it was a world that I uh, went into and entered into. Now, my dad was on uh, a nuclear submarine, uh, the USS von Steuben, 632, uh, and he was a, a submarine diver. They would go out and do repairs to the outside of it, so he got his uh, scuba certification uh, and did all types of repairs for the submarine. When he got out of the service, when I was a young kid, uh, he cleaned the undersides of boats in marinas and he had his own uh, scuba gear. And I can remember going down and taking lunch to him with my mom. Okay, she took the lunch, I was just along for the ride. Uh, and he would be sitting on the side of the dock and he would eat his sandwich, then wait his ceremonial four minutes or however long. And then he would wrestle that scuba tank back up on his back and uh, get all of the apparatus and the, the gear, and he would roll off of that dock and disappear under the water. It was an amazing thing to watch as a young kid. It's interesting that he took his world with him. He took his world with him. What did he need under that water? He needed to be able to breathe uh, the air from his world so that he could function in that other world. By the way, you and I uh, are ordained as the children of God to not be of this world. That we need to breathe the air of another world so that we may function in this world. Uh, we are left here to do God's work. You say, where does that come from? Well, that comes from the one who is our Savior, who is our Lord, who is our Master, Jesus Christ, who says in this pas passage, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. I think sometimes we get our, our minds just a, a little bit uh, sidetracked with the things of this world. We look around and we say, well... The political climate is not optimal. Uh, things are not going the direction uh, that I hope they would. Can I just remind us for just a moment that he said in the latter times, uh, the love of many would grow cold, uh, that things would be worse and worse. Uh, we, we're fighting prophecy if we think things are going to get better and better. This is where I disagree with the Jehovah's Witnesses who feel like they're ushering in the kingdom of God and things are leading toward peace. Uh, I'm sorry, the Bible says in the latter times they'll say peace, peace, but there is no peace. Uh, there's turmoil. Uh, there's wars and rumors of wars. And this is uh, what we see that we're facing in all this turmoil. And we can start to let all of that external turmoil get in our hearts. And we get anxious and say, well, uh, things are just not, uh, I mean, my kids are not going to have it the way uh, I had it or my parents had it. And America's falling to pieces and the world is crumbling all around us. And we can get so involved with what's happening here, we forget to breathe the air from the world where we belong. Can I remind you what Hebrews chapter 11 says, uh, that the uh, far fathers who went before us in the faith uh, were ones who said, hey, we're looking for another world, for a city that's not built with hands. We're looking forward uh, to being there. Now, I believe we ought to be salt and light in the world that we live in. Uh, we are to make a difference in this world, but we can't stake all of our hope uh, in our claim in this world. Not only the socioeconomic political scene, sometimes it's just our personal life circumstances. My wife said yesterday, I hate being sick. I don't know anybody who loves it. Now, some people love the attention they get when they're sick, okay? But 
I don't think anybody says, you know what, this is my fourth doctor's appointment this week. I'm just really scoring big. Boy, I can't wait. I mean, I've got two appointments. I can go one in the morning, one in the afternoon, get some Chick-fil-A in between. We'll just make a day of it. Have you noticed as you get older, the more the doctors want to check up on you? They want to bring you in and pick you apart and tell you all about it, and they never have good news. Uh, they're just always telling you something. You know, yeah. They used to tell my grandfather, you're doing pretty big for a big guy, or pretty good for a big guy. <laughs> uh, pretty good for a big guy. There's always some little undercut, you know, there. Uh, I'll tell you what, when we face these years, as we go forward in these years, uh, we can start to realize our real hope is to go up there. Our real hope is to uh, go to the place where we belong, where we are strangers and pilgrims in this world. We are citizens of that heavenly country. And we've got to keep our minds on the fact that we are not of this world. And if we are going to function well uh, in this climate, then we must be like scuba divers and take some of heaven with us. Are you with me? Uh, we've got to go around in this world breathing a different air uh, so that we might keep our minds settled and our hearts fixed uh, on Jesus Christ. I want you to see their dirty dealings, uh, their dirty dealings. What they were doing was dirty, and they knew it. What the Pharisees and the uh, scribes and chief priests were doing was dirty, and they knew it. Uh, you say, no, no, they thought they were clean. No, no, they tried to look like they were clean, but they knew what they were doing. By the way, this brings us back to a, uh, a human tendency, and that is to try to look clean in the eyes of others and disregard what you know is right or wrong. To try to, hey, listen, the court of public opinion is not whether you're, where you're right or wrong. You're right or wrong before God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself uh, to God. We are going to give account uh, for what we do and what we say. You know this is the case because the very first thing they do is they say, don't question us. Don't question us. Uh, verse 28, and then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the hall of judgment, and it was early and they themselves went not into the judgment hall. Why? Because they could not be ceremonially clean for Passover. So they come and then say, hey, take him inside, but we can't come inside. Uh, we don't want to be a part of this dirty business. Now that's for looks, because we already know they have paid blood money for Judas to betray. They have already tried to accumulate false witnesses to accuse Jesus. Listen to Matthew 26, verse 59. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yea, they found none. They said, hey, go find somebody to witness against him. Well, what are they going to witness? I don't know. Find something. By the way, that's not the way justice works. Have an opinion, have a, a, basically a sentence, and then try to work backwards to get uh, the story or the narrative that will fit it. Uh, we have got a skewed sense of justice now in our nation, by the way, where a, a, an opinion will happen. And, and our, our ideals as a nation have been innocent until proven guilty, right? That's the ideals. But now it is guilty <laughs> in the mainstream media Guilty in public opinion, and if the courts don't decide that way, then there'll be uprisings in the street. That's backwards. That's backwards. Now, I'm not saying the courts always get it right. There are times when things go wrong, uh, but we have to, as a nation, have a sense of justice, and we as Christians ought to be saying, hey, now hold on a second, before I, I gulp down too much uh, Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or whatever uh, and make my determination, I'm not sitting in the court. I'm not there hearing out the arguments. Uh, we must, as Christians, have a proper sense of justice. By the way, many of our, our uh, uh, ideals for justice came uh, from what God taught in his word, and I believe they're worth upholding. Now, they have uh, now brought this accusation. Now they want to borrow Pilate's authority to put him to death, 
And Pilate has the audacity to ask them, so what is it that he has done? What is their response? If he were not a malefactor, we would have not delivered him up to thee. <laughs> it's kind of something along these lines. Well, why would we go through all of this trouble if he wasn't guilty? Can you think of a few reasons why people would go through a lot of trouble to take an innocent party and make them look guilty? Matter of fact, they've already said it, uh, where he, they said, uh, hey, listen, it's better that he should die and us not lose our station. It's better that he <coughs> would lose his life and us not lose the position that we enjoy. By the way, this is also what has happened uh, in our political scene where people will get a taste for power and then anything goes to keep that. How careful we must be. They wanted Pilate to put him to death. They had lost consciousness of what is right and wrong. They sought an end and any means necessary to get that end they would employ. They had an end, now they were going to find the means. By the way, good ends do not sanctify dirty means. Good ends do not sanctify dirty means. Or as my grandmother used to say it, two rights or two wrongs don't make a right. Just because you're trying to get something to work out, you can't do something wrong. Uh, to do right. Or as Bob Jones Sr. said, uh, you can't do a wrong to make a right. Uh, you can't try to do wrong to do right. Okay? Or as he said, I think the actual quote was, it's not right to do wrong to do right. I think that's right. Let me understand that statement. It's not right to do wrong to do right. You say, that sounds like a high moral standard. That means not only should we seek right and righteous ends, we must seek them with righteous means. That what happens behind the scenes is as important, is important as the stated end. This means... For our church, it means when it comes to uh, keeping the finances, when it comes to stewarding what it is, we have to be very careful. Some churches will say, well, you know, it's just the Lord's work, and they start sweeping under the carpet. Many things. I'm thankful for our staff that work so diligently. By the way, this week we work so hard, uh, many on, uh, and our deacons, on getting our insurance situation right. How many of you know that's a headache? But to try, by the way, a blessing, uh, they're raising our premium almost $4,000 this year, uh, and we said, what can we do? And they said, well, uh, once your premium goes over $20,000 a year, that point, <gasps> once it goes over $20,000 a year, you can apply for a re additional discounts. And so we're doing all kinds of discounts and then working with them over a three-week period I'm here to say we're paying $200 more uh, than we paid last year for our insurance. Now, with all of that being said and done, those are areas of stewardship. Uh, and oftentimes, people don't look at the small details and say, hey, all of the details should be right, not just the right end. Now, the way they went about this was wicked. It's declared to be so in Acts 2, uh, in verse 23, uh, where the Bible says, Peter says to these uh, Jewish people, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. He said this was a wicked uh, thing to do. Bob Jones Sr., in that famous sermon in which he uh, made that quote, uh, said this, right is always right, and wrong is always wrong, and we must learn to separate the two. If you love the right, the Lord will give you light to seek the right in everything you do. Here's what he said in that sermon. Do right till the stars fall. Do right till the last call. Do right when there's no one else to stand by you. Do right when you're all alone. Do right though it's never known. Do right since you love the Lord. Do right, do right. Do right, do right, do right, do right. I feel that we've gotten to a place in a society 
uh, morally where we have come uh, to conclusions that we can do underhanded things to accomplish uh, what would be morally good things. I'm not for it, I'll be honest with you, whether it's Republican or Democrat, whether it's conservative or liberal, when we are sweeping things under the carpet uh, that are underhanded because we're trying to do the greater good. How many of you heard that term before? It's for the greater good. That's often a terminology used to try to force people to do that which is wrong. Can I tell you, we ought not believe in the greater good. We should just believe in the good, not the bad and the ugly. The good, to say, hey, this is right. Uh, and therefore, they came and they said, hey, uh, we've got to get rid of this guy. A and they questioned their motives. And they said, well, if he wasn't guilty, we wouldn't bring him to you. Don't question us. We see not only their dirty dealings, but their doubtful disputations. Their doubtful disputations. The term doubtful disputation comes from Romans chapter 14 and verse 1. He's talking about issues that they had within the church. Uh, some issues were about uh, one day being recognized above another, one holiday or holy day uh, being recognized above another, and some saying, well, this one is more important, that one's more important, a and he deals with that. And he says, hey, listen, uh, that's not something that we have to do or be a part of, uh, and there's young believers coming into the faith, and they're struggling with this. Uh, by the way, the other thing that he talks about is eating meat that was formerly offered to idols. Again, it was a struggle in the church, and some were saying, hey, uh, well, I can't eat that meat that was offered to idols because I used to be a part of the idol worship. And he said, listen, if that's what a younger brother is struggling with, uh, then just abstain from meat. If it's going to hurt his conscience, his weak conscience, he said, but uh, for those who understand fully what God has done, that meat can be cleansed, received with thanksgiving, and it's not a problem. Then he starts out in Romans chapter 14, verse 1, and he says not to receive a weaker brother into the uh, faith if they're going to do it to doubtful disputations. What are doubtful disputations? Well, doubtful means uh, there is not a clear way uh, to decide it, okay? It's doubtful, things that are unsure. And the disputation means a strong argument. Now, I know you don't know anybody this way, but there are some who will argue very strongly over things they're not entirely sure about. Met anybody that way? That will have a really strong argument over things that are not important. Uh, some people just love, I mean, they just love to argue uh, about what's going to happen in heaven after we get there. I heard one person that said, well, you know, over in this room are going to be all of those uh, who are part of the, the bride of Christ. And then there's a whole room full of guests. And I mean, they'll try to go to the Bible and prove that some people are in the bride, some people are not. And then they'll argue till they're blue in the face. They have, believe so strongly about this, they'll move their church membership before they get their U-Haul. Why? Because they're afraid if they die on the way there, they'll end up over there with the guests. By the way, in their guest number is Moses and all the Old Testament saints who will come in and serve the bride, the marriage supper of the Lamb. How many say it sounds skewed biblically? <laughs> oh, but they'll argue over it. I mean, they'll have knock down, drag out, kick you out of the church kind of arguments. Uh, and this is something you say, well, is it or isn't it? Well, I can't say for sure. I can give you Bible. And we might even disagree about some of those things. But you know, why do we argue over the things that are less sure? You know, if I'm going to argue over something, I want to be over the blood atonement, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of those things we'll find out later. Who are the four and 20 elders? <laughs> I'm hoping Brother Danny's going to yield a, uh, a decision on this in his classroom, uh, and then he and I can, can just enjoy. Uh, no, he's saying no. Oh, man. 
I one time taught uh, the book of Acts in Bible college, and uh, there was another professor uh, teaching the same, uh, same curriculum. Well, actually, it was his notes that they gave me. So I read his notes, and then I realized I did not agree uh, on certain things in his notes. So I'd stand up in my class, and I would say, now, I know other professors teach other things in this Bible college. It wasn't anything of any major uh, doctrine. Uh, I said, but uh, here's what I'm teaching, and I want you to go to the other professor and tell him that I'm right. Make sure to do that. Now, I believe there are things that we can be concretely dogmatic about from God's Word, and there will be clear scriptural authority to do that. But if we're on shaky ground, why get so loud and dogmatic about it? Uh, there are those who spend their time filling the Internet with their videos, uh, and one of the things that they are very good about is being very confident in their position. Very confident in their position. They'll even sign up to debate other people and uh, really just try to trash them. By the way, if your timeline on your uh, video or social media is filled with people arguing and disputing, I'm going to say you're going to lean yourself to doubtful disputations, to be full of debate and envy, the Bible says. Now, these men came without any solid argument. You know what they came with? Very strong confidence. Matter of fact, if you'll read, they come beating their chests. Oh, man, that's a microphone. We'll move that out of the way. This was a, set, a way of saying that they were overwrought with grief and torment. It was a, a thing in the Bible times to just say, oh, I can't believe it. And so here's Jesus, the innocent son of God. And they're going, oh, he's so wicked. Oh, we can take him away. Oh. And because of that, the crowd keys off of that. And the chief priests go around and say, hey, if they offer it, say, crucify him, crucify him. And so they have men walking through the crowd. And so when the time comes, they say, hey, who we want, Barabbas or this one Jesus? And they say, not this man. Give us Barabbas. What do I do with him? Crucify him, crucify him. The average person didn't know why. They were just doing what they heard. But I tell you, these men knew what they were doing. These men knew exactly what was going on. Can I help safeguard you against a time where Satan will tempt you to build an argument that has no foundation because there's a means that you are in that you want to find? Sometimes you just don't have a solid argument. Sometimes you'd like to see that guy next to you at work get fired. I tell you what, you've got to let him... Rise or fall on his own two feet. There's times where you would like to be able to build a case, and yet there is no clear uh, accusation. I want you to see their accusations were doubtful. Do you know what the two main accusations that they made against Jesus were? I'll give them to you. Matthew 26, here's one of them. It says when they couldn't find any false witnesses, it says at the last came two false witnesses and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. Shock. What a shock. Now, obviously, they totally missed what he was saying. <laughs> because the Bible says, This spake he, the temple of his own body, that it would be laid down in sacrifice, and that he would rise again in three days. But they came in and said, You know what he said? I mean, and this, this just, I'll tell you what, this just strikes, this is why, why I just can't believe anybody anymore. It just strikes the note of the outrage, uh, outrage media that's happened now. This outrage media, like, you should be outraged by this. You know what he said? What did he say? He said he could destroy the temple and rebuild in three days. Oh, my goodness! I mean, now they would have video clips, you know, this really shaky video taken from a phone of him actually saying it, and then cutting the clip off just at the right moment, so he looks just really bad, and then somebody voicing over it, like with outrage in their voice, oh my goodness, and then have a really uh, incendiary title on social, social media, you know what I'm talking about? Religious teacher tells lies, and lies would be all caps with lots of exclamation points. Now, this is how they were treating it. They were saying, he 
said he would do this. I'm sure he was over there going, <laughs> nodding his head like, that's what I said. You don't know what it means, but that's what I said. <laughs> that was their one shocking, groundbreaking accusation. Here's another one. Saying that he was the king of the Jews. We find this here in our passage where, uh, where Pilate comes to him and says, hey, listen, did you say you're the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, are you saying that of yourself? Or does somebody else tell you to say that? <laughs> I mean, this is the beginning of a very frustrating conversation for Pilate. I mean, just follow it all the way through. He keeps asking questions and gets questions back. And he's thinking, I'm just mixed up in the middle of this thing. I've got these people over here that are saying, if I don't convict this guy, I'm no friend of Caesar. I'm going to lose my spot. Uh, they've got all these accusations, but none of, them none of them come together. I just want to wash my hands of this whole thing. And he tries, and it doesn't work. Bad day for Pilate. Now, when it comes to this matter, Jesus never said, I am the king of the Jews. Now, he did say, I am the son of God. They'll eventually bring this one up. Are you the king of the Jews? He said, did somebody tell you to say that? I think Pilate said, yeah, <laughs> they did. <laughs> that was their story. He said he was the king of the Jews. I think Pilate's like, wow, he's not wearing a crown, doesn't ride in a chariot. I don't think this is a really big deal. But these were the things that they brought, expecting him to be put to death on the fact that he could destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, and that he said he was the king of the Jews, although he never said that. That's doubtful disputations. That is what we would call hearsay. Something that no case could be built upon, but they wanted this to be the case. Now, not only were their accusations doubtful, their arguments were doubtful, and they knew it because when questioned about it, they said, we wouldn't go through all this trouble if he wasn't guilty. But Pilate had their number, Mark 5, uh, 15, verse 9. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye release that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. Pilate already figured it out. These people, it's not the fact that Jesus is guilty, but that they envy the following that he has, and therefore he must be eliminated. But this is really where I wanted to go. Our final point here, the, the defining declarations that Jesus makes. In the face of all of this doubtful disputation and dirty dealings, uh, now Jesus speaks up, to say something very definitive. By the way, it still rings in our time, these statements. I hope that we will receive them and live them out. And Jesus answered and said, My kingdom is not of this world. Say that with me if you would. My kingdom is not of this world. In other words, my king's kingdom is not in this world. A lot of people have gotten really enthused about Donald Trump. <laughs> Matter of fact, he got king status in this last uh, uh, presidency cycle to the point where it was, no, uh, not just our president. He is this dynamic figure that I must be loyal to. Now, I'm thankful for the good policies that he put uh, in place while he was in the office. But can I tell you, my king is still Jesus Christ. And I will be loyal to him above any political figure. Uh, my loyalty, whenever that political figure of any time, uh, I'm asked to say either him or Jesus Christ, I'm choosing Jesus Christ every time. Every time. I was in the Capitol this week, and there was a man standing up, and he was, he was waxing rather eloquent about where is the church and he just went on, and it was, it was a pretty good statement that he made. Another politician got up afterwards and said, hey, right now we're trying to stop big casino gambling from coming into the state of Georgia. It's starting with sports betting, and then it's going to casinos. By the way, one of the places they want to put in casinos is Hawkinsville. They want to make it uh, a resort destination. By the way, that's what you'll hear in the news. It will not be casinos. It will be a resort destination. There'll be jobs. There'll be money. By the way, for every $1 that we get out of it, $3 are put into it. That's not money-making. 
If someone said, hey, we're going to invest your money, you'll put in $4 and you'll get $1 back. I mean, you say, I'll pass. And they're saying, hey, uh, resort destinations, we're going to do all this. And the lady stood up there and she said, uh, by the way, where is the church on this matter? The man who spoke before voted for this. It went dead silent in the room. You know, a lot of times we get to the place where we have loyalty to some cause or loyalty to some person, but my king, Jesus Christ, his kingdom is not in this world. Therefore, as a child of God, I'm not seeking political favor. That doesn't mean that through political means we can't accomplish some good. And I'm thankful for godly people that are placed in places of government uh, to make a difference. And I think there ought to be more of that. But I can say this clearly, that when we have to do something against our Savior or against the truth to gain political favor, I was talking to uh, uh, Congressman uh, Jim Bridenstine out of Oklahoma, and when he got up, uh, to, he was an appointed uh, appointee where they replaced somebody uh, that had passed away or was sick, I can't remember. Uh, and when he got up there, they said, hey, listen, now that you're in Congress, you better learn. You've got to go along to get along. You've got to learn. He said, I'll tell you what, I got appointed here. I'm not looking for a second term. He said, so I'm going to do what I believe is morally right. They said, you will never last. You just happen to be an appointee. You think you're going to come up here uh, and do this kind of thing? He said, I did everything that I thought God would want me to do on every vote, on every signature. I did what I felt God wanted me to do. He said, then I went back and I was unopposed. And so then I was elected. He said, you should have seen the faces of those guys when I walked back into Congress. They said, oh, man, you're back. <laughs> He was put on the House Ways and Means Committee, which controls financial spending and all that. And they're thinking, oh, man, we've got this righteous guy uh, sitting and doing these righteous things when we're trying uh, to get these matters accomplished. By the way, uh, if it has to be wrong to get it done, it's the wrong thing to get done. Now, he had asked him, are you the king of the Jews? If Jesus had said, I am the king of the Jews, he would have taken the largest demotion that any king has ever taken. Because he was currently king of kings and lord of lords. Or you could say it this way, king of everything. Jesus was the king of everything. The Bible says all things were made by him and for him. He was already the one who rules over all things and be standing before Pilate and Pilate saying, hey, are you the king of these measly Jews? And he says, did somebody tell you that? Almost in a way to say, because I never said that. I, I never claimed to be the king of the Jews. No, uh, when I came into town on a donkey's baby following her mother, they begin to hail me as king. By the way, that is not, although we would call it the triumphal entry, the most luxurious way to come into town. It was prophetic to show his humility, to show that although he was king of kings and lord of lords, he would be the suffering servant slain uh, for our sins. And so here he comes in on this donkey, and they start hailing him, Hosanna, Hosanna, and all of a sudden, the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, they say, oh, we can't let this get out of control. No, he wasn't the king of the Jews. Although, in an uh, interesting and ironic turn of events, that's what he'll place on his cross. We'll talk about that later. I love this song. Let's talk about Jesus. How many of you have heard this song before? Let's talk about Jesus. The King of kings is he. The Lord of lords supreme throughout eternity. The great I am. The way. The truth. The life. The door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. Hey, if we're going to talk about Jesus, let's make sure to get uh, his title right. His kingdom was not of this world, and he was not seeking a worldly kingdom. I think this is so apropos for where we are now that we are not seeking a worldly kingdom. For those Christians who under 
Roman rulership in A.D. 100s, 200s, Diocletian and other Nero put under horrible tortures. I think nowadays, if that were to happen, we would say, sorry them. Too bad they didn't have a better political caucus and the right lobbyists and maybe really a, a good social media presence so that they wouldn't have to go uh, undergo all these indignities. And I tell you, Christians for all time have undergone suffering, and yea, all who are godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And they have undergone it knowing when they were huddled in a group and putting their children in the midst of them as the lions were led into the arena for sport, and as they huddled over their children and the lions were attacking them from the outside, they were not saying in their minds, oh, if we had more political power. They were saying, into my hands, into thy hands do I commend my spirit. We're going home. We're going to be a part of the kingdom we were actually a part of. Oh, Rome is not our home. They met in catacombs that were underground tombs. And they would get down in there and worship the Lord in song, in hushed voice, and read the scriptures together. Many of you know the sign of the ichthys fish was a secret sign in which a one believer would draw an ark uh, in the sand, and the other believer would complete that ark with a fish because they were fishers of men. You see that they lived under times of great persecution, but they said, hey, our king did not have an earthly kingdom. He said, if I was going for an earthly kingdom, my people would fight. How many of you say, sign me up? <laughs> Get out the M4s, let's go. But he said, if, if that was the case, my, my, my soldiers would fight. Peter pulled out his sword. He was ready to go. He was going to hack heads off. A little poor aim, but he still got something accomplished. Ready to fight. And he said, my kingdom's not of this world. By the way, he will come as king of kings, lord of lords, whose vesture will be dipped in blood. By the way, when your enemy shows up with blood-stained clothing, that's not a good thing. Who comes on a white steed with ten thousands of saints with him who will not be needed to assist him in battle because he will overcome his enemies by the word of his mouth. The Bible says that word will go forth out of his mouth like a sword. And he'll just speak. Hey, he's the king of kings. Remember, he's the one that stood out on the water and told it all to be quiet, and the molecules of water and the wind and everything just stopped. Get that one in your scientific pipe and smoke it. He just said, stop, and the water stopped. And the wind stopped. I'm sure the birds started chirping. It was probably the most unusual thing ever to see. The Bible says they were astonished. He said, this is the one who will return. And when he is ready to fight, he won't need soldiers. I don't care about kingdoms of this world. Some pastors are trying to build kingdoms. They want a ministry that's very self-gratifying, and it's big, and it's... Uh, so can I tell you the truth? I'm not the most important person in this church. Jesus Christ is. If ever it gets that way, get rid of me. Please do me a favor and do you a favor. I may be the one declaring the word, but it's not my word, it's his word. And we've got to keep our minds focused on the fact that we may never have a kingdom in this world. You may never have a piece of property even to call your own and post all of those don't trespass would be shot signs that you've already got in your garage. Uh, my favorite one was a picture. It has a, a, a pistol on it, and it says, uh, this, uh, this property is monitored by a high-speed wireless device. By the way, Satan offered him kingdoms of this world. Matthew chapter 4 Verse 8, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. 
There's a price to pay, but you can have them. Now, Jesus responds with scripture, and I'm thankful he did. Had I been in his shoes, I would have snickered. You're going to give them to me. I who created them all. And you who only have them for a short time. Right. Why would I do that? And Jesus himself had been offered, but said, hey, I don't look for kingdoms of this world. By the way, he does not want his followers to seek kingdoms of this world. Kingdoms in this world. By the way, he says, lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. You might be tempted to try to make it the very best. And I think sometimes we get into these political schemes and all of that for this reason. We hope that they will make our life better. If we get highly involved, I, mean, I, I know one guy, he said, you know, I, every time they send me one of those text messages saying, you know, donate, I donate. How I many of you got on one of those text message things? This is your last chance. Well, this is the 18th time you told me it's my last chance. If you give today, your money will be 10 times duplicated. Like, we'll tell whoever has the 10 times duplicated money, just go ahead and give it. Why they need me to give? Well, we're trying to multiply our funds because this is our last chance to save everything that's ever precious to us. Now, again, I want to be salt and light. I want to make a difference. I think we ought to be good citizens in the nation that God has placed us in, and I'm not against going into politics as long as you don't lose your moral compass on the way in. But I am saying this. If I don't ever have a kingdom in this world, that's all right. I'm a part of a kingdom that's already established and will one day straighten out the kingdoms of this world because he is the king of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. Here's what I would say finally to you. Put on your scuba gear. Put on your scuba gear. Breathe different air. Don't breathe this world's air. You weren't made for it. You don't have gills to breathe in the water of this world. You need to bring your own air with you. Say, where do you get that heavenly breath? You get it right here. Get a little bit of that in the morning, put it in your tank, and breathe it all day long. And when you realize, you know what? I'm probably never going to be a rich man. Anybody get to that yet? I'm working on my second million, by the way. My first million didn't work out. You may have realized, I will never be a rich man. That's a sad moment when that happens. I will never be a rich man. They spent a lot of time telling me this in Bible college, but I didn't necessarily believe it, that if you're a Baptist preacher, you're never going to be a rich man. It took me 17 years of being one to finally come to, I'm never going to be a rich man. Can I tell you, I can be rich in eternal things. If I've got what makes, fills my needs down here, if God takes care of me in that way, I can thank the Lord. I don't have to have all the luxuries of this world because I'm not of this world. I'm going to breathe a little bit of heavenly air through my SCBA and keep right on going for the Lord. And maybe this world's going to get worse and worse. But I'll tell you what, that just makes all this sweeter and sweeter. I was one time talking to Dr. Sisk, and I said, Dr. Sisk, what helps you keep going? He said, well... Most of my friends are already over there. He said, you get to be my age, you've got more friends over there than you got over here. So he said, I know where I'm going to end up. I just don't know when. So until then, I'm going to keep on going for the Lord. Just keep on going for the Lord. Breathe some of that heavenly air and live another day. Don't get too tied up in this world. I think some people just need to shut the television off. Just turn it off. Turn off your social media feed. Try, try fasting from whatever you watch or listen to the most for a month. Just try it and see if you want to watch it or listen to it so much after one month is over with. You might say, this is unnecessary. And begin to breathe in that heavenly air and let it fill your lungs. And you can live in this world, but not of this world. Lord, I pray that you would help us. Lord, I needed to hear this this morning. When our ambitions fail and maybe what we thought would be accomplished in our life, and we feel like maybe we've done less than what we hope to do, or when we feel like we're not going to be as financially set as we'd hope to be, or political losses in our nation, 
or things that we see all around us. Sometimes it makes us feel like the walls are closing in. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, as our Savior did, to declare we're not of this world. This is not where we need to succeed. This is not where our kingdom is at. Lord, I pray that we would live for another kingdom. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the statements you made while you were on trial under great duress. Thank you.